So thank you, Siddhartha. Thank you very much, Siddhartha, Guillermo, and Sergio for having invited me here. I'm very glad to talk to you today a little bit of the work I've been uh, doing in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and uh, more recently in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, the team of uh, CPIG Neuromatch at USP. And uh, today I chose to talk a little bit about uh, motor cognition um, neural underpinnings of motor cognition is the title of this presentation. In fact, it's a mixture of uh, some basic concepts, but most of the work I've been doing in the lab in the last years. And uh, here is a very pragmatic um, uh, definition of movements. We can think in terms of sensory motor transformations occurring through time. And this is a sequence of uh, uh, pictures, photographs taken by Edward Muybridge in the late 19th century. And uh, this is before the advent of the movies as we know it today. And uh, the idea here is to call your attention to the fact that in fact when we speak in, in terms of human uh, uh, movement and movement in uh, animal behavior in general, we uh, uh, can uh, consider that uh, they happen in a sequence of events and we can also think that uh, uh, for each of those events you have a brain activity that uh, is correlated to the upcoming movement. So we are interested in uh, voluntary movements, in motor planning and, uh, and uh, still in the more basic uh, conceptual domain when we think about the, the, uh, the importance, the, the, the way the brain uh, produces these movements, uh, we uh, uh, touch the, the course of dimensionality that was mentioned by Antonio Galvez this morning. In fact, you have to coordinate more than 600 muscles. And uh, the way we think that the brain uh, uh, operates in, uh, to reduce dimensionality and to organize these movements in a beautiful, sequential and uh, uh, proposeful way is to produce what we call a motor program. And uh, in this uh, motor program, uh, the force direction, the tra trajectory uh, must be implemented so that uh, you attain a goal or final position or the intention of movement that can be um, represented here, sorry. So, uh, in neural terms, uh, we know that uh, there is uh, a bunch of uh, cortical and subcortical regions that are inter interconnected that associate to movement production. And here in uh, this uh, review of uh, Scott in Nature Reviews, just to call your attention to the fact that Vision and uh, uh, proprioception and uh, somatosensory information is continu continuously uh, being taken into account so that uh, uh, the movement is produced in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate context. So, um, put in uh, computer computational uh, terms, uh, we can think that each time you, you uh, produce a movement, a voluntary movement, a motor command is issued that, and uh, you, you, uh, a movement is produced. And uh, this is continuously happening. I mean, in terms of uh, each, for the next step, the context is taken into account the vision and the sensory feedback is taken into account to produce the, uh, uh, the next movement, so on and so forth. So uh, this is a, 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 an abstract of, uh, I mean, it's a nice picture of uh, 
this uh, process as it occurs. And uh, uh, within this, uh, uh, the dom the, the, this uh, domain of uh, computational domain, uh, we consider that continuously uh, the brain has to produce what we call uh, a forward model uh, or an estimate of, of uh, the sensory and the motor consequences of the movement which shall be produced. So this is an, um, a schema of uh, this uh, proposition which is pretty much um, uh, spread over the people that work within the motor control domain. And the idea here is that uh, each time um, uh, you, you should take the, in consideration the actual sensory feedback and the sensory motor context or the condition so that you can select the appropriate motor command and each time you uh, uh, do this, you produce what we call an efference copy, which is uh, an ancient concept, in fact, which, which is, has been modernized by these people here. And uh, uh, this efference copy, which we can also call as predictor, would uh, uh, be compared with the um, produced movement and the actual feedback, sensory feedback produced by the movement. And this uh, sensory discrepancy would show, should, should be taken in consideration for the next movement to occur. And this would be a, uh, a basis for uh, motor learning within this uh, framework. So, um, in this context, uh, predicting would mean anticipating uh, motor sensory outcomes. This is a picture of uh, von Helmholtz. This, he was the first scientist to propose the existence of this uh, uh, efference copies that would, as I said before, uh, bring forth the, uh, um, an estimate of, uh, of uh, the, the consequences of the movement as it occurs. And uh, what is interesting about this proposition, which uh, was uh, uh, later coined as the Helmholtz heritage, is that it uh, allows establishing causal relationships between actions and their consequences. And also, uh, it uh, embeds the dynamic simulation of our body and the context as movement occurs. And uh, it allows the reduction of uh, the uh, movement produced uncertainties, learning, as I said before, so on and so forth. So um, there are several nice reviews on these uh, topics done by Wolpert and colleagues from uh, UK, UK. And just to uh, uh, summarize, um, to, to mention that uh, among this uh, proposal, some uh, researchers have uh, brought forth back the ideas of the, a Bayesian approach to, to discuss uh, um, the, the, production, the production of movements in the, the internal model context. So say that, for instance, we are about to pick up uh, this, uh, 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 this object. Uh, so you uh, have a, a continuous sensory feedback, uh, proprioceptive and visual feedback of the object, and you can uh, generate, your brain can generate predictors of uh, possible uh, con uh, uh, situations of the object that we call the priors. So you can, for instance, suppose that uh, in context one, this object will be empty, and in context two, it will be full. And in, for each of these situations, we, we, you should uh, uh, estimate a, co a sensory consequence. And uh, this could, uh, um, if for instance, the object is uh, 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 really empty, the, uh, you, you go to a high likelihood, I mean, you have a small prediction error. Uh, whereas, uh, if you uh, know beforehand that the object is um, close to empty and in fact is full, you have a low uh, likelihood or a large prediction error. So the idea uh, is uh, within uh, this uh, framework, 
As we generate motor commands, we make predictions about their sensory consequences. And when you have a, a feedback, you integrate your, observa sorry, your observations uh, with, your, uh, with, uh, with our predictions and form a belief about how our motor commands have affected the state of our body and the world around us. So this is what we call the state estimation. So uh, this works for the uh, production of movements, but also uh, for what we call the uh, motor cognition domain or the mental simulation states. So this is uh, an area of research that has been pretty much influenced by the work of Marc Janereau. Um, the, the idea here is uh, that uh, whenever you, uh, you uh, produce, uh, you pretend to act or to, you imagine a given action or you make a prospective action judgment or uh, in prediction context but also in action observation and in action in dreams, you would recruit um, a brain network that is uh, pretty much similar to the one which is activated whenever you produce that movement. So this is an illustration of uh, what we think that could be happening. I mean, for instance, when the kid imagines uh, 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 having a kiss from her mother and the sequences of events that she, she could uh, rehearse mentally, to uh, attain the goal. So, uh, in this context, we can also speak about prediction in the, in the sense that you are producing estimates of uh, the events, the upcoming events. Okay? So, either in when you imagine or you when, even when you observe or when you predict uh, the sequence of movements that are going to occur in a, in a given uh, context. So, uh, the discussion here I would like to, to bring to you and talk a little bit today is uh, uh, trying to figure out how these uh, predictive models are implemented in the brain. So, uh, we will start with the first example in the action observation and prediction domain. So imagine that the person is watching uh, 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 somebody else producing movements. In this case, in fact, what we did here was to put uh, a marker in the, in the main uh, articulations and uh, film the person walking. And then you just present the point light. This is a point light display technique. That maybe uh, Danielle spoke a little bit about this in the beforehand. And uh, what you have is uh, the reconstruction of a person uh, running. So, uh, how these uh, models are implemented in the brain. So, we uh, started working uh, some years ago with uh, Gislaine Saunier in a protocol using those point light displays. And um, uh, the idea here was to compare a, situ a, a, su a situation, a sequence of uh, movements uh, as the one I just presented you before. And uh, these movements will disappear behind the curtain or a, 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 an occluder. And then he, he appear uh, some seconds later and uh, 120 seconds later uh, and 1020 seconds later and to compare this situation with the situation that we call um, um, scrambled where each of those dots in fact corresponding to each articulation will be put in a different position and uh, the idea was to try to figure out through uh, the measure of uh, uh, the uh, brain activity evoked by the visualization of these dots through EEG, uh, what would happen in this uh, period where the uh, person sees uh, uh, a walking figure disappearing and then reappearing behind the curtain? And uh, we took this uh, approach of comparing uh, 
uh, what we call the biological motion versus scrambled motion condition so that we could extract the difference in the uh, EEG between the two conditions. So this is an example of uh, the kind of signal that you obtain using the, this approach. So this is a signal from the electro T6, for instance, just to show you the two conditions and the uh, through time. So the visible part here in green, the occlusion period in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 pink, and the reappearance uh, period here uh, in blue. So you can see that uh, whenever a, a person observes the beginning of a movement, you have this uh, strong deflection of the EEG signal that we call the visual evoked potential in this case. And here you can compare the biological uh, condition, which is uh, blue, with the red condition, which is the scrambled uh, uh, configuration and uh, or see that there are some difference through uh, the processing, not only in the visual evoked potential, but through time. And this was plotted uh, in these uh, graphs, as uh, you can see here, this, those are all the electrodes. This is a, a, a 16 configuration electrode. And for each line, the difference between the biological motion and the scrambled motion through time for each condition, the visible part, the occlusion condition, and the reappearance condition. So uh, you see that uh, the, our region of interest in, in this case was the occlusion period. You see that, uh, in fact, it was clearly uh, evident that we could still detect difference between the two conditions while the uh, the, 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 the figure was behind the curtain. So this was uh, discussed in this paper as a, uh, as a maintenance of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of a representation of a movement through uh, the period of occlusion. Um, in collaboration with uh, uh, Daniel Freiman, we took this uh, visible part, the, this very first part of the of the of the uh, uh, this experiment I just show you, and uh, uh, we decided to analyze using EEG functional networks. I think that Daniel talked a little bit about this, so just to remind you. Uh, in fact, what uh, uh, we did with Daniel was to uh, build uh, uh, functional network maps of uh, the brain activity by taking in consideration, by looking at the synchronization activity between uh, pairs of electrodes. And uh, uh, we uh, obtain uh, this kind of uh, representation. So this is uh, uh, one repetition, uh, one uh, trial of uh, biological motion visualization during the visible period. period. Uh, this is a, another repetition in another moment in time. As you can see, the functional networks are quite irregular. They vary a lot through time. This is the same for the scrambled motion condition. So but uh, uh, we had, Daniel had the idea, in fact, to consider the uh, uh, functional network parameters such as degree, betweenness, and clustering for each node in the network. And uh, we were uh, uh, happy to uh, identify uh, differences in specific uh, uh, electrode points or ver uh, vertices of this, uh, net this network. And for instance, uh, for the F7 electrode, which corresponds to Broadman areas 44 and 45, which are related to the um, processing of uh, the coding of movement and the, uh, the visual observation of movements, uh, there was a clear dif difference between biological and scrambled motion in degree and between this, meaning that for the uh, scrambled motion, much more electrodes were uh, associated to 
this region as compared to the biological motion condition. Uh, interestingly, this uh, uh, brain region was also shown by an other uh, researchers to be um, crucial in the detection, in the discrimination between biological and scrambled motion uh, in the paradigm where they applied, uh, they, they blocked temporarily this region with uh, TMS. So uh, by uh, repetitive TM, applying repetitive TMS in this uh, area, it was uh, uh, much more difficult for the subject, for the volunteer, to discriminate between biological and scrambled motion. So this was an interesting result. Uh, we also f f uh, found that uh, the um, parietal electrodes, parietal occipital region, was also s uh, sensitive to the difference between biological and scrambled motion. Uh, and uh, behaved like a, 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 a separate network, a cluster of uh, electrodes in the higher in the biological as compared to the scrambled motion. Um, These uh, this results uh, are part of a publication that uh, just appeared in the Revista FAPESP and uh, there is also a, a video to uh, uh, discuss this results, so if you uh, are interested in taking a look on this. this uh. Okay, so, um, so th th in fact, the idea that uh, there will be a network that associates to the observation of uh, movement, as we said, uh, uh, area 45, 44 in humans, F5 in primates, and uh, which would be highly connected to the uh, parietal cortex, the uh, superior temporal sulcus region, and the cerebellum. I mean, this uh, network of brain regions that uh, are repeatedly have been shown to code uh, the action observation um, that will be re retrieved in the uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, during execution that will be retrieved in action observation and that will also could be uh, uh, activated whenever uh, we, est we produce estimates about movements Well, we uh, recruit forward models to produce estimates about movements uh, is not that new. I mean, uh, Chris Mayo has uh, 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 made a nice review about this topic in 2003. But there were, f uh, at that point, few experimental evidence that it would, should be the case. So, uh, one of the uh, papers that uh, are very interesting and very powerfully showing that, in fact, uh, this uh, brain circuit or this, uh, uh, the brain is able to anticipate uh, actions and uh, um, and that the forward models could be important to, to this process has been done by Agliotti and collaborators uh, in 2008. And what they did was to present videos of, uh, of uh, uh, professional basketball players to uh, three categories of uh, observers. The trained uh, basketball players, the professional basketball players would be watching films of uh, other trained people. The um, naive people, the young uh, uh, trainees that have no uh, motor experience, on, uh, enough motor experience on training. And um, uh, what we, they did was to uh, use the transcranial magnetic stimulation technique in the primary motor cortex to evaluate uh, uh, the hand muscles that could uh, participate in the shooting of this, uh, these balls. And they had two conditions. One condition where um, the, the, they called the in condition where the shoot was correct. They were able to send the ball in the correct place and the out condition where the basketball player would 
uh, just shoot and, and uh, make an error. And the idea was that um, evaluating the cortical spinal excitability of uh, the hand muscles and the, in, in two different muscles, the uh, uh, adulto digiti minimi, which moves the, the pinky finger, and the, um, a muscle that controls the, uh, the wrist. And what they found was that uh, for elite players, it was, very, it was evident that uh, applying the transcranial magnetic stimulation in the very moment of, of uh, where the, 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 the basketball will be shooting the ball towards the, the goal uh, was the specific moment where it, it was possible to discriminate in shots versus out shots. So uh, this evidence that there was a continuous estimate occurring uh, through the observation of these actions uh, and that it was clearly um, uh, distinct for the elite player whenever uh, uh, this shot, at this moment in time, uh, before the, the ball was uh, at attaining the, the goal. It was clear for them that in this moment of time, the observer, the professional elite player, would be able to discriminate whenever the shot will be, would be correct or incorrect. This occurred only for the elite players and not for the young trainees. So this was an interesting paper that uh, evidenced the fact that if you have a previous motor exp motoric experience on, on this uh, training, you are able to uh, produce uh, estimates that are correct as compared to if you don't have this uh, previous training. Okay. So in, the, in this line of, uh, of uh, evidence, we uh, worked in a paradigm. We, we designed a paradigm together with uh, James Kilner, which is now uh, in the UK, uh, where we had uh, three different conditions. Uh, one condition was we called movement observation whenever the person uh, uh, was presented to a video where uh, there was a green object and the hand directed to this object so that the person would watch the sequence of movements. The green object, a, a movement uh, a grasping movement and then back to the original position. Uh, and the second condition was the no movement observation condition. Whenever uh, the red object would occur, there will be no movement directed to the object. And the third condition that was called execution condition, where the subject would have to uh, make a button press. We were interested, interested in trying to identify what we call a marker of, of uh, prediction, of motor preparation. The fact that uh, whenever the person would see a green object, he knew that there would be a movement as compared to the condition where uh, when the red object would appear, they knew already that there would be no movement. Okay? And this was comp com uh, compared with an execution condition uh, to, uh, to draw for the subject uh, uh, what we call uh, a readiness potential. So this is a, a, a marker of motor preparation that was described for the first time by Cornelius and Dick. Um, and that corresponds to a slow, neg slow negative way that precedes the beginning of a movement. Okay. So, uh, our hypothesis was that uh, in the movement observation condition, we expected to have uh, a, a negative slope, uh, um, uh, a motor preparation sequence. Yes, this is uh, uh, a, a brain activity that precedes the beginning of movement and it's identified through the EEG. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. And uh, this, uh, in fact, this uh, brain activity emerged from the coordinated activity of, uh, of uh, a network of brain regions, including the premotor, the uh, uh, supplementary motor area, the mid cingulate. So it's a wave of activity that precedes the voluntary movement. So it's a marker of execution, of a motor preparation before execution, and it was used in this uh, paradigm to uh, separate or to identify what would be a, 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 a brain a marker of, uh, of uh, the fact that each time you see a movement, you produce an estimate or you prepare as to to, to you, you make an estimate of the movement that is going to occur. Uh, so the subjects knew beforehand that it, the green condition would correspond to the uh, uh, movement observation, that, that there will be a movement in the, in, the, in the screen, and the red condition, there will be no movement. Yes. Um, so what we found was that uh, each time the subject, I mean, the, uh, reproducing the results of Cornuber and Dix, and Dick, each time the subject uh, prepares to move, uh, there is a negative slope and a redness potential that, so, that associates to this condition. But also whenever uh, we know that the person in the video is going to make a movement, we also prepare, we also um, uh, identify a uh, negative slope. And in the red condition, no movement condition, there would be, there would be no uh, response. So this is the, just a topological map of these uh, differences and the represent, graphical representation of this, uh, the inclination of the slope here. So, uh, just to summarize this uh, first set of results, predicting an a forthcoming action performed by another agent involves the recruitment of a network of sensory motor regions as revealed by the redness potential, as inferred by the presence of the redness potential. So we took this uh, result as, uh, the, as a, a suggestion that the knowledge of a coming action automatically activates the motor system. So this is just a representation of this. So the red object arrives, and uh, it's detected by the subject, but there is no, uh, uh, it, it doesn't evoke any uh, preparation or any estimate of uh, up an upcoming movement. In the green condition, the presence of the object, and the fact that the person knew beforehand that the movement would occur, there will be, uh, a simulacrum of a motor command or an estimate and, uh, and um, uh, the, the um, uh, emergence of a, an efference copy or a prediction that uh, the movement will be occurring at that time. So uh, to test the importance or the contribution of uh, two, two different regions that were known as uh, being part of the action observation network, we uh, investigate the effect of lesions, specific lesions in the uh, parietal or in the premotor cortex of uh, uh, patients. This was done in collaboration with uh, a, a clinical team in Lyon uh, uh, using the very same protocol. So. Uh, movement observation, no movement observation, and the execution condition. So this, this is just a, a, a descriptor of the patients that we have tested. Uh, we had six parietal and four premotor patients tested with this same protocol. And what we found was that uh, we reproduced uh, with age-paired age subjects the effects of, uh, of uh, movement observation in the group of healthy subjects. And what we found for the patients who had parietal lesions were, was that this uh, uh, 
motor preparation for the green condition uh, disappeared, wasn't present for these subjects. Uh, uh, they were, however, evidenced in the premotor patients. So this uh, suggested, this indicated that um, the parietal cortex, uh, the parietal network, or this node in the brain, in the, in the network, would be important to uh, generate estimates of upcoming movements by observation. Um, could you please interrupt me if it's not clear or if you have doubts, okay? So this is just a map of uh, this uh, effect. So uh, the parietal cortex would act as a key ne a network node when one predicts forthcoming observed movements. And uh, what was interesting was uh, the dissociation between the, the role of the parietal and the premotor cortex in this case. So, uh, again, our schema. In the case of uh, the green condition for the healthy subject, we pro had, had, had proposed that there will be an efferent copy uh, that will be uh, affected by the lesion of the parietal cortex. So we are now uh, starting to apply these uh, uh, ideas or this, this, this discussion in the Institute of Neurology, the Olindo Couto. We have now a new laboratory there. In, uh, uh, and uh, we are working with patients who have uh, brachial plexus lesions. So these are young pa uh, people who have uh, motorcycle accidents, most of them. And uh, this is uh, in, the, in the more severe uh, um, cases, what happens is that the uh, uh, arm is completely disconnected from the brain sens in sensory and motor terms. So uh, there is a doctorate student who is working with uh, an adapted version of this uh, paradigm, and we would uh, we are would like to know uh, if uh, the fact that uh, you have no more uh, online ongoing information of the arm, how does it affect the uh, capacity to predict upcoming movements? So this is uh, something I will probably tell you in a while. We still are working on the results. So uh, now I'll, I'll, I would like to move to uh, another uh, s s set of experiments that were uh, inspired and uh, motivated by the discussions we've been having in the context of CPG Neuromatch together with Antonio Galvez. In fact, we uh, discussed a lot of these uh, 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 concepts and these ideas and the fact that in the first set of experiments I showed you, in fact, we uh, speak about estimates, but we have only two conditions. Uh, either there is a movement or there is no movement. The subject knows be beforehand that it's the way it is. So it's a, the set of probabilities here is very limited, <laughs> to say the least. So we started uh, trying to figure out how to uh, approach the uh, problem of uh, of. Uh, uh, producing estimates in the domain of motor control in the more realistic and maybe more uh, defying way. So this is a, a, a work, a, a paper, a revision, a review paper that we are sending to archives pretty soon, <laughs> where we discuss a little bit these uh, ideas and the concepts I, show you, I showed you. And uh, about, uh, among the questions we put in the, this manuscript is uh, how does the brain build the probabilistic models used to perform the statistical inference tasks required by motor prediction and more generally to produce actions? So here uh, we started really uh, to brainstorm on the available possible uh, experimental configurations we had at that time and what could be um, uh, changed in the experimental terms, which kind of experiment we should produce, we should uh, think of to bring this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, inference discussion, the, the, the idea that the brain is continually f making inference about the, the world and, and uh, 
which is very crucial in terms of motor control. And uh, so the second question was how these models evolve in time so as to incorporate former experiences and corresponding inference results. So this is also something which is pretty much neglected when we think in terms of, uh, of um, models of motor control. Uh, it's hard to consider a movement as a, a, a sequence, a chain of, of events and uh, also because we have uh, not, uh, we have few instruments, conceptual and, uh, and technical uh, instruments to approach this, uh, these points. And uh, how to represent the network structure involved in the inference time. So uh, this is also something that uh, um, we were pretty much uh, unhappy on uh, how to think and, uh, and how to instrument this, um, uh, how this is physically implemented in the brain, okay? So uh, now I'll show you some of the uh, uh, ongoing research that we've been doing with uh, Antonio Galvez and where we try to uh, approach this uh, uh, these questions uh, experimentally. In fact, uh, uh, we started uh, our first discussions of which paradigm uh, you, uh, to use in the, to think in terms of symbolic chains. I don't know if Antonio, uh, uh, if, if you remind. Uh, we, we, we would like to, uh, in the beginning to use a, a movement by uh, as a elite sportsman, <laughs> in fact, it was a woman, a beautiful one, uh, Fabiana Mure. No? <laughs> and this is when the mathematicians and the hobbits start inter to, to interact. It's the problem is that the experimentalists keep saying, no, it, it won't work, this way it's not good enough, no, you have to control all the situations. <laughs> And then we came to a, a configuration where we were a little bit happier, which was to use uh, uh, rhythmic um, uh, chunk structures. Uh, so hand clap sequences, organized in ternary, quaternary, and uh, indefinite sequences. I'll show you the, the stimuli. Um, uh, of course, there were, there were already people thinking in terms of uh, how the brain processes structures and make predictions of, uh, of uh, and, and prediction errors. And uh, Stanislas Dayani and his team are working on this uh, direction. Uh, what they do, what they did in this paper, uh, it's, I think it's PNAS 2011, I'm sorry I didn't put the reference. Uh, what they did here was to present a sequence of uh, tones um, uh, to volunteers and uh, to change, uh, so to change the, uh, there, there was a standard sequence and they changed it and, uh, and uh, just at, at the sequence, they change uh, uh, the percent of uh, times that a local standard or a local deviant, meaning that uh, you had four tones, tan, 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 in 50% of case, or a condition where they call omission the by simply uh, erasing the last tone. And uh, uh, it's uh, 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 there are many more conditions in the paper. I'm not going to discuss the, the whole bunch of results they, they found. But what was interesting was that they were able to map. So this is uh, three different techniques. This is EEG and MAG in two different, uh, 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 two different uh, 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 perspectives of MAG measurement. And, and uh, what was interesting for us was that uh, whenever you compare the comparison of the sequence, the complete sequence with the omission block when, the, uh, when you erase the last sound, uh, produce what we call an omission evoked potential. I mean, the brain detects the, last, the, the lack of information, the, the fact that you have 
uh, missing information in this situation. So this was interesting for us. We started uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, which kind of structure we could use in these terms. Um, and uh, by I, I'm employing these sequences, in fact, uh, what we called vowels, samba, and, uh, and uh, independent. In fact, the stimuli consists of independent samples produced by dis distinct different stochastic rhythmic sources. And uh, the sample was a sequence of strong beats, weak beats, and silent units uh, generated by a probabilistic source. I'll show you the, the stimuli. And again, here we were interested in comparing, looking at the uh, EEG signals generated uh, f first of all in each uh, of the conditions, in, in each condition, and then uh, trying to figure out um, the specific uh, activity that associated with uh, each chunk, each piece, each unit of sound. Antonio, if you want to interrupt me, it's okay. Uh, so the question was, is it possible to retrieve from the GEG signal the structure of the source producing that stimulus? So I'll show you uh, the sound of the stimulus. So this is what we call the vowels. So this is the structure, a strong beat, a weak beat, and a silence. And uh, as Antonio uh, presented this morning, the idea was to uh, use the sample. I mean, we have this sequence of, uh, of numbers, and this can be represented as a context tree. In fact, what we did was to replace, so this is the original sequence, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1. And uh, in 20% uh, of the cases, we replaced the weak beat, what we call the, w the one, the weak beat, uh, by a silence. Okay? Uh, this is the second uh, rhythm. It's a simplified samba. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so here again, as you can notice, um, we made the same operation. So this is two one zero one. So there is a. <gasps> Uh, what we call the constitutive um, uh, silent tune. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the original 2101, 2101, 2101, and we replace the one with the probability of 20% by a zero. So. Is that clear? Yes? So, uh, as Antonio said this morning, in fact, you can represent these uh, constructions, the, this uh, symbolic chain by a context tree. So, do you want to comment, Antonio? No, no? I don't want to comment. Okay. Uh, the third condition is... Uh, we called independent rit rhythm units. So, and the con in, in this case, we have no context tree. I mean, it's reduced to the root. In fact, you present uh, at, at each time point. You can have any of the of the three uh, possibilities. So, it's uh, with the probability of one third. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so up to now we have tested 15 healthy volunteers. Uh, in fact, uh, for each volunteer is, ex is exposed to uh, these rhythm blocks of uh, 12 minutes and uh, we make a concatenation of the three rhythms uh, with uh, a semi, uh, it's a structured present uh, in fact, block with the independent in the middle always. Uh, we are uh, collecting this data with uh, uh, EEG geodesic 128 channels. Um, so this is the, the goal. In fact, the question is, is it possible to retrieve the context tree structures in the EEG signal? So uh, what we are doing now is to identify the chunks in the EEG signal. So this is a, a, a recording of the EEG for some channels here, a collection of channels. And here the label. So uh, for each of the, uh, the units, in fact, you have a mark in the EEG signal so that you can retrieve the specific uh, segments corresponding to each, uh, um, each, uh, each uh, uh, unit. For instance, V0, MIS, uh, V1, V2, okay? So for the omission, we call the stimulus miss. So this is uh, for Samba, for instance. As you, as you can see, uh, you will have, for instance, a chunk which corresponds to the constitutive silence unit, V0, and uh, uh, just immediately after that, you have a second, uh, um, a segment which corresponds to the miss condition, the situation where there should be uh, a V1 unit and it's not present. Okay, so this is what we are be, you'll be, we will be comparing in statistical terms. So as I said, we can segment the EG data in uh, pieces so that we can identify the specific events. And now, uh, just a, a little flavor on, on the comparisons we started to do. For instance, uh, if you think in terms of uh, uh, MIS and V0, which is the constitutive uh, silent unit, uh, both of them, in fact, uh, are physically silent for the subject. I mean, he doesn't... Uh, uh, hear any information at this moment. But from a structural point of view, these two stimuli are, are clearly different, are entirely different. MIS is an omitted weak bit and V0 zero, zero is a constitutive silence unit. As, uh, as uh, the IN and colleagues have shown, uh, you have a distinct processing for the omission of the omitted big bit. So, uh, likewise, when you think in terms of the uh, V1 and V2, they are same in, in uh, physical nature, but they are physically occupying distinct positions in the rhythmic structure. So, for instance, for the first question, is MIS different from the V0? So, if I have uh, in the Samba structure 2101, 2101, the 0 is the constitutive, and uh, here, I, in green, I have a miss. So, are there differences in statistical terms for these two units? The same holds for uh, V1A and V1-2. So, still in the Samba structure, if this uh, Beat is uh, here physically in this position close to two, or if he here between zero and one uh, and two, sorry, uh, if it occupies a different position in the structure and in the tree, uh, is uh, are they different in terms of uh, uh, the EEG signal? So uh, we are comparing these uh, chunks of EEG signals using the projective method, which is uh, briefly presented here. And if you have, want to have more details, Antonio could maybe discuss about um, the underlying idea and proposals. And um, If it were real data, we, use, we can use statistical tests 
like I don't know, como Gov Smirno, whatever. But since you have functional data, why functional? Because these are chunks of EEG. So, and this is a problem for statistics in general. And you can use several approaches. So there is this one. It turns out that I know Ricardo Freiman since a uh, 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 long time. And uh, they have a wonderful method, which they call projective method. And it consists in projecting the functional data in real numbers in a, some way. And then this enables us to make the test on real numbers. But this is, is a technical detail which is not important. Uh, maybe it's important for technical view, but uh, here the question is we want to test if uh, two types of silent are, have the same law or not. Uh, we guess they should have different laws because one is already every time there, it, it's constitutive of samba, and the other appears by, uh, because they decide to delete uh, one like uh, a human drummer does when he plays a rhythm. So don't, uh, don't worry about the technical details. If you are interested, you could discuss it during coffee. But this has not to do with neuroscience. It's just uh, a problem for a statistician to discuss. Thank you, Antonio. So this is uh, very pre preliminary data. So this is... Uh, in the first group of eight subjects, but just to show you that um, when you compare, uh, these are the electrodes that dis distinguish mis from v0. So this is a topology of the regions or the networks that will be distinguishing these two conditions. And uh, very nicely, we have. Um, uh, the other contrast I just mentioned with V1A versus V1B, and we find a group of electrodes, a uh, restrict group of electrodes that are able to distinguish with V1A versus V1B. And uh, okay, just to conclude, uh, so. We uh, found interesting results by comparing omission and constitutive beats, as well as uh, preliminary data on the similar beats, but embedded, embedded in different positional structures. So we are um, excited by the possibility that this EEG signal could encode this subtle structural difference with for of symbolic chains, and we would like to talk. I mean open the discussion with you about this topic and... Have you repeated the same experiment with a given subject in different times to see if, whether there's any difference? Say, in one of the experiments, there's a difference in another one with the same subject. There's no difference or there's a difference in a different position and different... We, we have three blocks and the one, one thing we started doing was to uh, look at the... Uh, comparisons within each block. So look at the block separately. And uh, these are very prelim preliminary results and because we were expecting to find some learning process through, I mean, whenever you uh, acquire a structure, uh, how it evolves in time. Is it your question? I'm thinking about, say, self-sustained activity, the ongoing uh, things that are on the person's mind. So sometimes you, you listen to a music, to a song at the early day, and then you keep the song in your mind for the entire day until something happens and you forget about it. So from day to day, I mean, the, the, the responses could be different just because the person is not even tapping the hand, but just thinking on different, uh, being influenced by what he or she listened uh, while coming to the laboratory. So this may aim for it. Thank you. Um, so just to present a group and our collaborators, uh, do you have any other questions? It's open for uh, discussion. A couple of a related analysis questions. Um, so did you ever throw a beat into where there was supposed to be constitutive silence and then compare when you omitted 
when, when you omitted a beat that was supposed to be there versus when you added a beat that wasn't supposed to be there? Because I'm, I'm wondering, for instance, whether that effect you see has to do with the, the omission or just um, surprise. Um, I'm wondering if it's just a general unexpectedness signal. I also want to like to know if you did, and I think you say, were saying you did, and I just couldn't, couldn't make out that part of the conversation. Did you um, take two beats that are not supposed to be very different and compare them and make sure that you saw no differences in the EEG for two, even, even for like dividing the session in, ha in, in, in pairs and comparing first to second half? Yes, thank you. Uh, for the last question, we did it in fact for V1, V1A versus V1A. In fact, what I, sh I showed just a, sh a part of the results, but in fact, for V1A versus V1B-A and V1B versus V1B, and then we subtract from V1A versus V1B, and what we have here is the remaining electrodes that show exclusive difference for V1A versus V1B. So it's possible to... So, so there yes. So there are differences between every... This is the result for the omitted versus constitutive. See? So it's... Well, quite expected in terms of topology. If you look at the results of the IN, for instance, they make topological maps which are broad, broader than the results we are having here. But it's, I would, I mean, it's sort of temporal and lateralized to frontal. So it's, I would, uh, I think it's a good result. It's a small number of subjects, but. Uh, for the other comparison, maybe this is the one you had in mind. Yes, this is the more astringent statistical result we have because it's exactly what I told, what I told you. This, in fact, uh, resumes the fact that V1A versus V1A uh, the, the, these electrodes are equal for V1A versus V1A and V1B versus V1B and are only, only differ when you compare V1A versus V1B. It's quite strict, it's true. Um, this will be, I mean, uh, uh, very surprising, as you said, to have a very localized response. Constitutive empty beats means that this is what the person is expecting that to be empty. And if you toss a, a, an actual auditory audible beat in there, that should be, in that situation, since this is a simplified prep, that should be an unexpected event. And then you can directly compare that to the unexpected absence events and ask whether those... And I suppose you could also, um, since these are complex beats, you could throw in the occasional unexpected um, you know, uh, uh, offbeat. Where they, where, where you know, if you've got boom, pop, pop, boom, pop, pop, where you've got um, a, some sort of, where you've got like a a, 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 a beat on the end of three or something like that, but but that would be, um, what I, I guess what I'm concerned with in general is specifically that you're comparing something that people have been trained to hear or not hear to to a surprise, and that, that I would want to know how general is the signal you're getting there for just surprise, because there's a large literature on, on responses to unexpected events. Well, I, I have a couple of comments. Uh, the first is regarding this. I kept thinking about uh, the fact that you don't allow them to tap, for instance, it's very natural. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that it's wrong, but uh, I guess you will see a big difference in terms of predictability, for instance, whether they are tapping or not, because naturally everyone would like to tap, and that's what we do, especially if you are looking at motor areas, right? So that's, that's one comment, but it's related to a comment on the first part of your presentation and that is the imagery uh, that you see in motor areas or sensory motor areas. Uh, so you interpret it as a sort of a simulation in preparation for the movement. And that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, uh, 
it was interesting that you mentioned Kawato because I know that Kawato and Doya are using these ideas to program robots in Japan. But the problem is, it's not your problem, I think it's everyone's problem, is how about interference? If I'm, if I'm using motor areas to simulate future commands, first of all, how is that discriminated from actual perception? And how does it not interfere when I'm preparing, you know, I'm doing this, I'm preparing the next movement. So that, I would expect that there is some interference between what I'm actually doing and what I'm preparing to do. I don't have an answer to that, but I just wanted to comment, and maybe you have some, you have thought about this. The first comment, you say that uh, the fact that Yeah, but this is, I mean, uh, uh, most all the experiments using motor imagery, in fact, this is uh, the gold instruction. You're not allowed to move. Do you think that in the second condition that is independent, when the stimulus are randomly, that the volunteers may be a little bit ancient about the, because there is no water, so they trying to match the, the structure. Which one? Uh, independence. Yeah, the independence. We didn't look much at the results. I mean, we didn't, it's the beginning. We are working in the analysis of the results. We, are, we didn't look much at the independence. What's your hypothesis for this? I was wondering because I, when, I, when I listen, I get a little bit stressful because I try to to identify and I, oh my, so there is no, so I was wondering if there is no company of emotion component, it's stressful and maybe. Uh, this uh, stimuli, in fact, um, influenced by Sebastian, which one is one of the authors, they were ranked in terms of uh, uh, affective uh, uh, scale performance, so we will, we shall, we c uh, next time I show the results, I can tell you about the, this difference, the specific difference, if it's so. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank uh, Claudia.